everybody, we are back. Uh, I'm so excited to close out the day with this panel. Uh, we have some amazing, amazing producers here uh, to talk to you sort of about the difference of making theater in the nonprofit world and in the commercial world. So moderating our panel, we have the founder and producing artistic director of Gold Shore Playhouse in Naples, Florida, Kristen Glory. Who is the executive producer at American Repertory Theater at Harvard University? Who is the vice president of content and creative at Ambassador Theater Group? And finally, we have Neil Pep, who is the artistic director at Atlantic Theater Company. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very exciting to be here and have this incredibly esteemed panel of panelists in front of me. So I'm going to get right into it. So in case you don't realize, uh, what we have here are two people who are running two of our most important not-for-profit regional theaters and, and one person who's, who is currently involved in commercial producing. So what we're going to talk about today is the relationship between not-for-profits and uh, commercial producers, and this is a this is a growing, uh, burgeoning sort of relationship as the as the not-for-profit uh, movement grows in America. So I think that's where I'd like to start. Is just that you know how how is it going? How has it changed in the last several years, and, and where do you see it going as as the regional theater movement starts to grow and as um, as commercial commercial producers start to rely on that partnership a little bit more. Um, I have an unusual experience for an American because although I'm obviously American, until I worked in ART, I only had worked in London. So it was routine there for me to have relationships with commercial producers and um, the theater that I used to run was called the Royal Court Theater and it had had its own commercial producing subsidiary since the 1980s. So I remember when I got here and I asked the board of the ART how the commercial partnerships worked, they were like, what are you talking about? And so for my board and uh, Cambridge, it was a journey. I, for, so my, in my personal experience, it hasn't changed so much, but I think looking around maybe to my peers and colleagues, maybe it's changed, but... Um, I, I'm in favor, I'm pro, as long as the right agreements are in place. So, that's me. Great, Kristen, would you like to speak to this? About the way that commercial producers are relying on regional theaters in partnership right now, and how that might have changed in the last decade, and how it might look, as it, uh, how it's going to change as we go into the future. Leave that with Neil, just because it's more from the nonprofit approach. Because for for commercial producers, I don't think it has changed much in the last decade as far as what goes into the decision and and why we go to nonprofit and all of that. But I'm sure we'll get to that we'll down the line. The moment. Um, I guess to, uh, there's a little history, some of which I know, some of which I don't know. But there was a time, really in the 60s and 70s, and even to a certain extent the 80s where merging the commercial and not-for-profit in any way was a sort of dirty word. Um, that, the, that, the, that the idea was the not-for-profits were supposed to be mission-based, staying over there, and the commercial producers would be over here to make money on Broadway. And, and even governmentally, there was questions about whether you could utilize a 501c3 from a commercial perspective. And then, as funding um, sort of dried up, government funding, large foundation funding. It used to be that not-for-profits in the 60s and 70s would rely on five major grants. I don't remember all of them. It was like NEA, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, and a couple of others. And a lot of those dried up or they got very small. So it became a question then, and when I sort of came into theater, which was the mid to late 80s, there was a question of how do we actually produce big shows? How do we survive as not-for-profits? And as that question was coming up, I think a lot of commercial producers were saying, well, how do we develop and germinate projects from a commercial standpoint and allow them to uh, you know, be <coughs> nurtured? So there was a sort of common interest, and I think we found a way, both legally and artistically, to come up with a process that worked. And I, I guess 
For us, it's been, we were talking about this in the green room before, it's been pretty good, and I think the main question is understanding roles. I mean, all not-for-profits are mission-based, and we, you know, you have to have a mission to create a 501c3. And so, it's important when you work with a commercial producer that they understand the mission of the theater, and when you talk about bringing a project that you both understand you have a common goal. And, because the, you know, Kristen obviously is gonna have goals about what she wants to do with all the amazing projects she's worked on, and she has worked on many amazing projects, and, uh, and then how that might merge, possibly, with a not-for-profit becomes the discussion she and I might have, or, or other uh, commercial and not-for-profits might have. So when, that, when there's a sort of mutual common goal, it works really well. Um, when we're at cross-purposes, or when it's sort of about not putting the goal first, but kind of putting power and information first, first then it gets a little squirrely. Um, but generally, it's been great, and it, we've sort of helped each other to realize a common goal. And um, yeah, so I'm excited about it. There's still lots of work to do. Hopefully, that answers part of your question, but it gives a little history on it. Yes, thank you. Could I just say one thing? Um, I always think as a not-for-profit, you can say no. So. I, so much you do the work that interests you, that fits your mission. Um, people very kindly offer us a lot of projects that I say, no, this doesn't fit, or we're quite a bossy not-for-profit to work with, so it doesn't suit everybody. And so I think that it, it's this somehow bizarre idea that everything they do is just like a done deal. No, it, you still have choice, the choice within it. And one thing that I get often asked in Boston is, um, I mean, for the most unapparently commercial shows, are you hoping this was going to Broadway? And I'm sort of, absolutely not. You know, that's not what our goal is on all of our shows. So I think sometimes there's confusion around it that you don't have internally in your institution, but that outside people might see that. But from my point of view, you know, we're up in Boston and I don't have a very big theater, it has 500 seats, it's a not-for-profit, a show runs maybe five and a half weeks. We've worked hard. If it can reach a wider audience, whether it's commercial or sometimes it comes to New York in a non-commercial way, that's great because you've done all that work and especially if it's good work, you want more people to see it. Yeah. Thank you. Kristen, let's talk about, uh, from a commercial producer's perspective, what might be the criteria that goes into making the choice between choosing a Lord Theater to partner with or um, sending a show directly to Off-Broadway? Absolutely. Um, to speak a little bit to shows I've done in the past, and whenever you're in development, and specifically the majority of the work that I've done at a nonprofit has been a musical, um, we'll often look at the city itself, we'll look at the theater itself. Speaking to something that Neil said, we always make sure that the director of whatever piece we're developing and the artistic director sit down because I do think there's a little bit of a difference in that relationship and wanting to make sure that expectations are the same so that as the artistic director is a guide, because I always, whenever I look to bringing a show into a nonprofit, we always think of ourselves as guests in someone else's house. And we want to respect that. We want to live inside, as Neil said, inside the mission. And also as a collective group, we're hoping to forward the artistic um, mission of the show itself and, and wanting to further develop it. And um, often, I will always, I'm, I'm based here in New York, and there's something wonderful about being um, in one of the nonprofits here. One of the challenges is there are not a lot of very large, and I mean physical space wise, nonprofits in New York City. So sometimes um, we'll, we'll be wanting to go out of town because the physical spaces themselves cannot accommodate what we need. Um, but I will use as a very successful example, Fun Home. Um, which prior to my joining ATG was the last commercial musical uh, that I produced. And we, we will often acknowledge that the process that we had at the public theater um, was, was integral to the overall success of the show. And I will even second that by saying that as, for those of you that are commercial producers, also looking at what their development process, getting in early to a nonprofit can make a difference. We were able to do a lab production 
I'm not just talking a workshop, a production where audience came in and we had great interaction uh, with them on Fun Home. And back then, for those of you who might have seen the show, in this lab production, the physical conceit was inside um, Alison Bechtel's studio with cartoon graphics projected on the seal on the, the wall behind. Whereas we went through this production lab, we realized that absolutely did not work. And again, going to um, looking back and being grateful for the process, had that have been the actual production itself, it might not have worked and we might not have had the same outcome. But because we really took time within the nonprofit and worked with them on what everybody felt was the best development process, it turned out uh, quite well. So I think part of it is looking at the show itself. Does it need some of the momentum in New York and the buzz and the dialogue there? Um, and also going, when you look at Boston and you look at the success that they've had, um, you know, also going into a house that you know has a great track record that can physically handle what you need um, and has a visionary leadership that also can uh, contribute to the artistic development of the piece. Thank you. So actually, Kristen, that's a great segue into asking the two not-for-profit leaders, what is it that, what criteria do you have for, first of all, why would you want to enter a partnership with a commercial producer on a particular show? And what would the specific criteria be for how you choose that producer in terms of it being a good partnership? Sure. I, I think the first criteria is always the work. So there's no question, and I think this is what Diane was getting into, we, we don't, we don't sort of say, oh my God, we really want a show to move to Broadway. We don't work that way. It's more about what are, what are pieces of work that we want to do. And if, if it happens that a commercial producer comes and says, look, I've been shepherding this piece, I'm really interested, we read it and go, oh my God, that's fantastic. I mean, that's an exciting thing too, which I think, I mean, Fun Home is such an amazing example to me because it's it was such a daring show to do. So to have a commercial team producer and team that was somehow committed to that and gather this remarkable creative team together, um, that's the best scenario. So you start with the work, and then why else do you have these? Um, because it's very difficult to afford in the not-for-profit doing musicals. Musicals are, for us off-Broadway, are at least twice as expensive as regular plays, sometimes three times as expensive. And that's just basic, and I think, we were talking about this backstage, I think our prices off Broadway are even, are probably less expensive than, you guys are Lord, um, Diane? Yeah. And yeah. Lord, so Lord is probably even more expensive. So it's, you start with the, the story, do you love the piece, and do you have a common vision for the piece, as Christian was saying, and then and then you talk about, it's, a, it's trying to afford it, and then, and then finally, and this is the glass half full of all of it, is we're not in the business of commercial producing, what I mean by that. And, and some, some places have gotten a little bit more into it, like Roundabout and, and some of the bigger theaters have Broadway shows. But I, I don't have the time, I can't, I wouldn't be able to shepherd a show on Broadway. I need great, if, we're, if a show's gonna go to Broadway, you need a, an amazing team of commercial producers to help that show find a wider audience. So it's a total plus if you have a show that demands a wider audience, like Diane was saying, to have a great team that then shepherds it uptown and shepherds it on tour and, and to London and wherever else. So, and we'll talk more and there's, a, there's usually a, a decent kickback um, financially if the show does well for the not-for-profit. So it can then fund more of your mission, like Chorus Line and Hamilton are doing, have done so well for the public and other smaller examples with some of the rest of us. I agree with everything Neil said. It's funny because sometimes, I feel like almost every project has its own origin story. So sometimes it's work that we've wanted to do and commercial producers have approached us, which is always the sweet spot <laughs> when you get that. Um, or somebody will come to us with an idea and um, the person I work with is also called Diane. Diane Paul is the director. And um, they'll just say, we want this at ART, and we'll be there. There's no, there's nothing. So we hire a book writer, and we think about who we want to compose it. And some shows, like Waitress, I think we worked on that on and off for about seven years, because it took us a while and several false starts to get to Sarah Bareilles. 
So that was very much a partnership, not here's a done deal. And there are some not-for-profits that are more what I like to think of, I'm sure they don't, as kind of four walls deals, but that just wouldn't be interesting work for us. And I hope that we have a good dramaturgical muscle, so that's what we like to flex. So that factors into to deciding what it is. And we're a very issue-based theater, so that's another part of great things have been offered to us, but we knew that somebody else would do it, and we wanted to keep looking, yeah. I will add just off of something that Diane just said. I also think looking at the audience demo, who, who are the people that normally come to, um, to see shows there? Do they have a subscription base? And, and what is that subscription base? Because as we always say, the last contributor to the development of the show is an audience. So looking to where we go out of town and why, um, there's always that hope that the specific audience that we'll be interacting with will help to contribute to the piece. Great, thank you. Let's talk about some sterling examples of these great uh, commercial and not-for-profit partnerships. And also, if you're willing to share maybe a story that didn't work out quite how you expected it to. Uh, who's, who's game? Um, well, the, the ones that, we've had a number of musicals we've, all, we've really, I think we've only moved to Spring Awakening and The Bad's Visit. Um, yeah. Those both went very well. <laughs> they, they did, but, I, but they're sort of similar to what we've been talking about with Fun Home, I think. I mean, Spring Awakening was interesting because it had been around for quite a while. They, Michael Mayer and, and Duncan and Stephen had, and, and Tom Hulse, who was one of the shepherding producers on that, had been sort of developing it. They did some work at Sundance. They did some work at the Lincoln Center Songbook Series and a bunch of other places. And they kept trying to figure it out, and and they they shopped it around to lots of people, and most people said the music's fantastic, it's way too dark, and nobody wants to see a show about teenagers sexual awakening and committing suicide and all that stuff. And so we looked at it and we went. I thought to myself when I saw it, the music is so good that even if they don't fix the book for my purposes off Broadway, I would say to my friends, pay sixty five bucks or whatever it was at that time. Um, I tell you to pay, pay money to come and see the show just for the music, even if the, the book doesn't work. Because um, I thought that was incredible and better than half the stuff that I saw off Broadway. Um, but they did fix the book, and that came down to the sort of process that we were all involved with, both at the Atlantic and the commercial producers who were mainly Tom Hulse and, and Ira Pittleman. Uh, the band's visit quickly was interesting because Oren Wolf had been Shepherd. He optioned the film the Israeli film in, I think, 2005 or six, and tried to make it into a play, it was developing a play, did some work at Hartford Stage. When it got to us, Itamar had done a rough draft adaptation, Yazbek had written two songs, Hal Prince was on it as the director, and I saw it, and I knew, I'd known Yazbek for 20 years, because he did music for our first show at the Atlantic a long time ago. So, I thought the story was fantastic, and I knew Yazbek yes, music would be fantastic. So I said, yes, we'll commit to it. Then we spent two years with them, developing it, got all the songs together, and then and we did probably a couple of workshops, and then, and then we produced it, and we literally had no idea. We really didn't. Up until, you know, even going into press, we were like, this could be a disaster because it was so subtle and weird and delicate and fantastic and thank God Cromer was able to kind of balance all of it. But it, it ended up turning out great, out great, but that was a very process thing about finding, I think like Kristen was talking about with Fun Home, you find, you trying to serve it and protect it and cheer it on without um, tainting it. And what I mean by tainting it is you don't want people sort of tapping your shoulder and saying, is it gonna make money? Is it sexy enough? How are we gonna market it to the masses? You wanna just grow it, and hopefully, as a not-for-profit, we can provide a protective, but exciting and fertile ground to let things blossom on their own terms. I would, um, did you also, when I think of Spring Awakening, Bands Visit, and Fun Home, Fun Home I also think of three shows that knew that the critical and editorial response to the show 
were going to be a fundamental part of answering the question of whether or not this show could go further, which for me is also one of those reasons of why do you stay within New York or why do you go out of town. Um, I would say the three factors that have led to um, more challenging experiences at nonprofits, uh, one has been um, not being on the same page as to the physical production, um, the scope of it, what's necessary, et cetera. For a number of these houses, when you go there, they build the set there, they build the costumes there. Um, and that's very different, and I wanna be really clear when I say different, I don't mean it's not as good, I mean it's different. And, um, and so you as the producer with your director who may or may not have significant experience at this nonprofit really have to have an understanding of what that means um, to the overall process that they're going to have at the theater. I will also say really um, knowing that schedule, you know, at most of the nonprofits, there's a very short window of previews before you are reviewed. Well, when you go out of town commercially, you'll play four, four and a half weeks before you might be reviewed. So really, again, being on the same page with the venue or with the theater as to how long are we gonna preview, how much time do we need? So for instance, in the case of shows that go to nonprofits, we make sure that we've answered some real, some of the bigger questions in the development process so that by the time it goes into rehearsal, for the production itself, it's not, it doesn't have to answer that during previews because we know we have a much shorter window. Um, and then the last thing I will say is also knowing how much rehearsal time you have during previews. Because again, that varies by um, each individual nonprofit. And if you have a director who's not, and I mean this again in more of a musical framework, if they are not as experienced and they're expecting a very commercial experience, there needs to be some back and forth with them on how it's all going to go down so that we, you maximize the time and use it as use it to uh, the best effect. This one's a hard one for you to answer because I'm like, it's so it's like, who's your favorite child a little bit to me? Because I think of funny things that we did, like when um, the director, John Tiffany, is an old friend of mine, so he said, well, can I come there and develop this weird little musical called Once? Yeah, that'll be good. And then I said, what do you want to do next? And he said, glass menagerie, and I wanted to die. Like, oh my god, those little animals. And then, um, you know, and we ended up doing that show together on and off for six years, because last year, after two or three years since, it's, since it had its Broadway run, it went to the Edinburgh Festival and then the West End. So it's a funny life that some of them have, and that was, you know, four people. It's not one of our big musicals that's so obvious. And then I think Pippin, I'm only thinking of the shows that I never thought I would do. So when Diane Paula said I really wanted to do Pippin, I was like, oh my God, band camp musical. And, um, and then it's still, it's in Japan this year. So they have funny journeys, these shows you take, and then some of the new ones, like I alluded to Waitress and other ones that we've done that have, you know, run for varying lengths of time. So they all feel to me like they went well in different ways and with different results. Um, I told them in the green room, the only time I've really had a problem is that one commercial producer reneged on the money, even though there was a signed contract. So now I have rules about when the money has to be in the bank, um, because I always thought, well, as long as you have the contract, you'll be okay. But um, that was the worst experience I could think of when we were talking about our worst experience. And we think that probably is the worst. <laughs> it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. So what what happens with the money? How does it work? Like you said, um, Neil, and now you're still making money off of some of the shows that you, uh, you know, Spring Awakening is still bringing in some some dollars. How does that work for a not-for-profit who's now partnered with a commercial producer on on something that now has a life of its own? I, you know, it's always an interesting question. I, I think some of this stuff is probably fairly boilerplate, though. This times when. You go, oh my God, they're getting that much. How'd they get that much? Or, you know, they're but called the public. Yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say that. <laughs> right, right. But even like the Dunmore, I was surprised. We did a thing with the Dunmore. I was like, oh, the Dunmore's getting pretty good, 
Good. I'm just going to call this out. When I ran the row court, I got more than I get at ART. Yeah, so yeah. We so there's bow down to there's the different <laughs> models. Some of it, some of it is. I'd like to say respectfully, some of it is a negotiation, and some of it is is fairly boilerplate. I mean, for us, interestingly, I thought we cut a fair deal on Spring Awakening, and actually, we haven't changed that deal, and that was 12 years ago. So we were our our general, you know, um, weekly gross, you know, and when it kicks up at recoupment, and our net, our our, our gross participation, our net participation. Even our, even our billing, that changed slightly, but it's been, those are the three things to me. It's always the question of how are you billed, what's your gross participation, what's your net participation. That's really going to be, the rest of it you can figure out, you know, but those are going to be the questions. And so, um, you know, it hasn't been that, I mean, there are times and maybe there will be an evolution where, where the not-for-profits will try to get more, try to get less, but I tend to feel like, again, it goes back to that question of if you're working with people you really respect, it tends to be a respectful negotiation. And the good news is, I mean, especially in this day and age where shows, a lot of shows are making a million dollars or more, I mean, in the case of some of these big musicals, two or three million dollars a week, that you're getting, you know, a percentage of that. And so it's great. It's great for the not-for-profit that you have it sort of, gravy um, and then and it goes into for us it all goes into a cash reserve so it's like a same with it's us a rainy we day don't we, it's for yeah. same with us which is a we whole don't. other discussion because you can there's a chorus line model and even I think Jim at, at Jim Nicola at New York Theatre Workshop when when rent was so huge when rent went away they had to adjust structurally because I think I don't want to speak for him but I think to, when certainly they were getting a little dependent on it, and we all it's sometimes do get yeah. dependent. On I know. It. I don't know how many people are commercial or not-for-profit producers, but that was that's the big thing to take away is not to use that income stream to make base your annual operating expenses on, because we all know it goes up and it goes down. So we put ours in cash reserves as well. So we have a, a variety of producers and writers and directors out in the audience. So my question for you would be, as you started into the theater business in whatever sector you are in, what one thing do you wish you knew that you have benefited from at the time? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess the thing that I've learned, I think I was afraid, I, I, I thought, I, was, I started out as an actor and a musician, so I came to New York playing in bands and acting, and that was my goal. Um, and I think I always thought that I just had to do one thing, and what I learned is I'm best if I have 12 things going at once, it's just how I work, I need to have 12 things going at once, if I have one thing going, I'll fail, because I just get, I over obsess about it. So. I started working with a, a group of people uh, called the Atlantic Theater Company, and they were just getting together in 85, and I started working with them in 86 or 87. And I just realized that I liked collaborating. I liked working with writers, I liked working with directors, I liked working with actors and musicians. And so, and I still was acting and doing okay at it, and I was still playing music and doing okay at that, but I found the excitement of collaboration with all of those people <laughs> so great that I started finding my way into directing, and I raised my hand to be the artistic director, thinking that I would do it for two years, and it's it's now been 20, geez, it's 26 or 27 a long time. Um, so I think for me the big realization is my capacity to do lots of work at the same time was much larger than I expected, and it was scary and uncomfortable, but also wildly exciting. So. That's something I wish I knew at the get-go. Don't worry about that. Don't be afraid. But it's a lot of work, but that's the fun of it, the multitasking for me. Weirdly, I always joke that I couldn't work in commercial theater because my idea of hell would be to have to do the same show for more than eight and a half weeks. So um, maybe that divides us. Um, it's weird. Um, I think for me, I don't know quite how to answer this question, but I think that what came to my mind is that 
you can have a long working life in the theater. And like, it's not a, you know, a business that you do, some people do, but for six or seven years and then you change and you do this, you do that. And I've never done anything else. And I think that knowing that you could have a long, differing but sustained career just was, would have maybe been an interesting thing to know. I don't know. I've worked in the commercial, uh, commercial end of the, the business from the beginning. And in a matter of a year, we did the Broadway revival of Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, Death of a Salesman, Brian Dennehy, and then Thoroughly Modern Millie. And by the way, um, I don't know if Ken's here, but Ken was our first company manager on Millie, all of those many, many months ago. And it, looking back on what was successful, what was not successful in that period of time, um, whenever I am talking with um, people who aspire to lead shows, to be a lead producer, um, uh, a general partner on a show, whether it be a musical or a play, I always say that even if you've been what they call above title on shows and you've, you've existed around a show, it is very different when you are in the lead producer chair. And it is always, I always recommend that you have a partner who's been there before. Because when you are in the trenches and they can look at you and speak from experience and provide, in some respects, um, a little bit of a roadmap, I, I have found um, the majority of people it's been, um, especially because in commercial producing, it's not as if you can take a number of courses. You know, when you're doing it, you're in the thick of it. And so I just always say to people, I wish, back then and again of those three shows um, one of them we were in way over our head and that part of it was because it was the first time we'd done it and we didn't have someone around around us that could help guide um, whereas with Millie we um, our partner was Hal Lovedig who had had um, a number of different shows and that was hugely beneficial to the overall experience great advice I'd like to open it up to you all I bet you have some great questions for this wonderful panel uh, raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. Hi, thank you. What kind of financial responsibility do you ask the commercial uh, uh, producers to give to, uh, to the nonprofit theater? Like what's, what's the financial commitment from the commercial producers? For us, it varies. Uh, we agree a sum before we go in. We look at a budget jointly. Um, one point I always like to make nicely is when it's at ART, I'm spending far more money than the commercial producer. And I just like people to remember that in terms of who's the producer in Cambridge. It's ART. Um, it's varied depending on the show and depending on the, the size of the, the ambition for the show. Yeah. I'm not trying to be coy by happily give you a range or a percentage, but I'm not sure what you're asking. I mean, what would help, I mean. It, it, you know, it's funny, so you're asking for a formula. Um, I, I don't know, some people, I think some people used to, there was almost like a Manhattan Theater Club formula for a while, but, but I, don't, I, I agree with Diane, there's not necessarily a formula, because, because it's not apples to apples, because like Diane said, we're not gonna charge you, in the budget, we're not gonna put rent for the theater. In the budget, we're not gonna include our general manager, we're not gonna include our company manager, all that stuff. So, it's more, to me, respectful fiscal discussion. So, and usually, smart commercial producers know it. Um, I think there's probably a difference in terms of how, say, La Jolla produces at, at their contracts, I mean, Sometimes I've seen shows at La Jolla and I was like, you could just lift, this is a big, big budget Broadway show. It's exactly as I'm gonna see it on Broadway. Now we're a 199 seat house with a decent sized stage. I mean, it's almost a Broadway sized stage without the wings. So um, it just depends on the size of the project like Diana's talking about. It may be a five character musical, it may be a 16 character musical. The band may be three people, the band may be eight people. Um, the set, maybe like Spring Awakening, a platform set and may have automation. So it's a matter of looking at that. Some people, I mean, I feel like most of the off-Broadway deals are fairly reasonable, but I, I, again, it's, it's not always apples to apples, so, so it's hard. But in terms of the agreement, like these guys were saying, it's just a matter of once you've discussed the amount, 
the schedule, and then just delivering, and the rest is, is the relationship. I think we might sometimes get more because our physical productions do go to Broadway, so you kind of know you're buying. <laughs> I mean, they don't. They need alterations because they don't fit, and we're not the greatest theater for automation. So sometimes something that at ART was manual becomes automated. Um, but I think that is a big difference. You know, I always tell my costume people, like, just think how many Broadway shows have your costumes in them because you built them to last, you know, and they're still going sometimes two, three, four years later, yeah. And that's uh, what I was just gonna add is, it really also depends what the commercial producer is expecting. As they say, if it's a physical production that you wanna be able to move, it will probably be a higher enhancement that's required based on what's there. Um, I think that when you look at do you go to a nonprofit or go commercial, part of the reason a commercial producer will make the choice to go to a nonprofit is because it will not be as expensive as doing a commercial production. But what you are giving up is what Neil referred to earlier, which is the back end. You are going to have a royalty and net profit participant that you wouldn't have had otherwise. The What for me is becoming slightly interesting is that you're seeing a lot of shows, because it takes so much momentum for a show to land on Broadway commercially, and especially original shows, you are finding that some shows are now even going to multiple regionals in an effort to increase the conversation. I think it would come from a way, Dear Evan Hansen, shows again that are not what we call brand titles who decided to go to multiple regionals before they went ahead and brought the show to Broadway. Uh, Neil, um, on the recent Spring Awakening, did you retain a royalty? Sorry, you mean Ben's visit? Or recent? Yeah, the the revival. Oh, no, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't, that's a subsids question, actually, which is good. Um, um, so, so subsidiary rights for, have gone through a whole evolution, and I think a really great evolution, which was about trying to respect and not rob, or I shouldn't say rob, but not impose upon you know, writers can have such a hard time making money, playwrights or anybody. So, so I think the amount of subsidies that are taken from not-for-profits has gotten lower and lower. The, the public, I think, came up with a formula which we go by. I can't remember. This is certain. This is a playwriting. It may not be musicals, but the playwright has to make a certain amount in subsidies before we would get a piece of it. I think the short answer to your question is we may have gotten a teeny bit but not a lot. The bulk of our money was coming, and this, this goes for most of our, our moves. The bulk of the money comes from when your production moves. We've had, I mean, plays like uh, Skeleton Crew, Between Riverside and Crazy, um, a couple of plays that for some reason have been produced all over the country, um, because they're great plays maybe, um, that, that uh, we do end up getting you know, more of a piece of the subsidies than we would have expected just because they produce so much. But that tends to be smaller. Hi, from a writer's perspective, we should be so lucky, from right here, <laughs> if we should be so lucky as to have a choice um, between a, a not-for-profit theater um, or a commercial entity producing it, is there is there a difference from us for for us as the writers? And then one of you mentioned that the Lord Theater was more expensive. Um, I write musical theater, so uh, more moving parts. Um, why would the Lord Theater regionally be more expensive? He said that, not me. So no, I I to, no, I was actually sorry. Um, <laughs> meeting the enhancement would be more expensive. I don't. Did we say it was more? Well, the, the, the only reason I said it is because I know that what we pay weekly, we're not a Lord. We're an off-Broadway contract, and I think most of the Lord contracts pay more. Yes, yeah, actors are better. So all I all I was saying, I don't I don't know that much about ART's budget or lawyers' budgets. All I'm saying is that what we pay per actor. Well, I don't know. Some lords have union houses. We don't. We're not a union house in terms of uh, stagehands. That can jack their prices way up. So, so there's just different models um, in terms of what the costs can be. So, so you're saying if you had a choice? I mean, for for me, that that's it, it's really what serves the piece well. I mean, I I feel like when a writer comes to me and says they want to take it to Broadway, I'm like, yes go to Broadway because 
if, if, it's, if that's right for the show and you love the producers, you're going to make money. And it's so rare that artists can make money in this industry. However, I've had plenty of very, very successful writers, established writers, say, no, I do not want to start it on Broadway. I want to start it at ART. I want to start it at the Atlantic because that's the best way to germinate it. I still want it to go to Broadway. Um, and I think, you look, most writers would say, if I can start it on Broadway, let's start it on Broadway. You just want to make sure that it's going to be successful. But it's that combination of, you know, it's sort of like if somebody said, you can do a $5 million low budget film, or we'll give you $60 million to do a studio picture. Well, there's a dollars and cents question about what serves your play or what serves the movie. but. Again, one of the things I like about being downtown is you're not, you don't have to push it at the audience front and center. If, if I've got to fill 1,200 seats a night on Broadway, I have to do major marketing. You know? and so, but I only have to fill 199 seats. And half of the, pre, uh, the first three weeks of previews are taken up from our members. right? So the pressure in terms of marketing and selling it to the public you, you can, I like that we can allow people to discover the piece on its own terms downtown. Then we can give it, and Kristen or whoever we'd be collaborating with would be there with us saying, yeah, let it, and a lot of the times commercial producers don't want to be billed. They, they want it not known that they're enhancing, so it's just allowed to germinate on its own terms. Then, when it's a success, they can run. I would add that um, art musicals, especially, I do think benefit um, from what I'll call the um, those very well respected either more theater or downtown theater, especially because their audience is a bit different. And if that audience knows the piece started there, they will come up to Broadway with it. But if it just starts on Broadway, it takes a long time for them to discover it because that's not where they often go for their art. And that's not insulting big commercial shows because I've produced them and I love many. But I do think when you look at the type of piece that you have, again, I agree with where Neil started. It all comes down to the work. And I think that as, whether you're a commercial producer, you work at a lawyer, you work wherever you do, your job is to serve the piece and to realize its vision. Um, and I think that even goes for commercial musicals. I, with so many non-for-profits in the arts closing their doors or combining efforts with each other, can you all speak to what effect the competition for the non-for-profit dollar and your patrons has on how you balance your missions and the risks you take producing new shows, choosing new shows to produce? I haven't been, haven't been at ART for 26 years. Um, ART was in real trouble when Diane and I took over, and I think that what we learned early on, and I speak very much for our, our audiences, is they were hungry for risk and bolder work and new work, because I think they did enjoy a lot of Chekhov and Shakespeare for many years, but their appetite had been sated. So weirdly, everything, I mean, you have to do good work, whatever you're doing, I know that, but everything has gone up, box office, contributed income, things like that. But I think that I have a, maybe, every, I mean, every town has a unique audience, but I have a, a very curious audience, so for me, Every time we do something crazy from the first show Diane and I did together was Sleep No More, and they were like, oh my God, nobody will ever come to this show. And now it still runs. So I think early on we were, as it were, rewarded for doing something that hadn't been done there before. For us, that was okay. Um, it's an interest, the premise of your question is interesting just because I, I agree with part of it, but there's, there's that question of, you could look at right now as a very, very good time for theater, and you could also look at now as a hard time for theater. I, I think you're right, yes, I mean, 
I don't know all the examples of, of not-for-profits shutting down, which ones they are, why they're shutting down. I would say that there are times when not-for-profits shut down for the right reasons, meaning that if they're not doing exciting work, if they're, if they're just sort of churning stuff out because they're like, oh my God, we, what does our audience want? We just, we just have to do something and it becomes formulaic and everybody's bored and nobody shows up. Then probably that shouldn't be getting funded and you know, they, they should either decide why they're vital or not continue, but I don't know which, one those, which ones those are. That being said, it is really, really difficult to survive as a theater in this day and age. There is no question about it. I spend equal parts artistic and equal parts raising money um, of time. And, uh, but I think what we're all saying is still stands, which is there was a time when theater was incredibly funded which in some ways was great, and in some ways there might have been work that had eight people in the audience, but because it was funded, it was something on stage, they might have been taking great risks, but it also might have been wildly self-indulgent. So there was, there was upsides and downsides to wildly funded theater. I had an interesting discussion with Darko Trezniak, who's Eastern European, but works a lot now on Broadway. And he was talking about the downside of wildly funded theaters in the Eastern Bloc where theater could get really dependent on that and, and, and for lack of a better word, boring. So the, there's, this weird, there's this weird relation, and it doesn't, I'm not trying to make a master generalization about Eastern European theater, because there's incredible Eastern European theater. We are all influenced and, and, and look up to that. So it's not, I'm not trying to make black and white statements, but um, I think to the point that everybody's making, we're all thinking like, we don't have a lot of time to see stuff. What do we want to see? And I'm not talking about commercially. I'm just saying, what, what can I tell you all? If you're my friends and I say, yeah, what do you want to spend 80, 125 bucks, $250 on? If I, if I, I want to recommend something that's awesome, right? And I don't want to, and, and so, and if you think about that, you're, you, if you respect the audience and think they're smart, um, that that you want to provide something that you think is great and entertaining and thought-provoking and says something about the times in which we live. So it's this weird dance, but part of it is about making essential work and part of it is also about surviving and you need to find sources of income. And it's gonna be a menu of possibilities from individuals, foundations, ticket sales, enhancement deals, money from commercial productions, whatever it is. So it's a it's a difficult question to answer other than it's, it evolves year to year and we do the best we can. But I think it is an exciting time and yet our ability to take risks. In the tiny theaters, I have a great ability to take risks. And, and that a tiny, I mean tiny, nine, 95 seats. 199 is our big theater, though it's tiny for these guys. Um, and, and, but even that, sometimes it's hard to take risks. So I don't know, it's a hard question to answer. All right, we have reached the end of this panel and the end of day one. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation.